I felt like we were to present the idea of union with God. And uh, obviously in this phone call, or I'm sorry, in this Zoom, we're all pretty much veterans, seasoned, been around the block with God a lot of years. Uh, but I'm also doing this for the sake of uh, archive and the future. So I'm going to walk through this a little bit. And this, as I'm pondering it, even several weeks ago, as I was pondering it, and then as I was preparing some notes, I just felt a, a pretty significant level of tenderness. And I felt like the presence of the Lord would attend to us. And I'm, I'm hopeful that my brain doesn't get in the way as I uh, present facts and pre present ideas and concepts, but that I'll also be able to track with uh, the presence of the Lord in the process. Um, uh, so I just want to pull up a couple of things here, and I'm going to again share screen. So I'm not sure if that's something you can read. Uh over the years, especially over this last century, we have seen a, a lot of things that were established in the early church through Jesus and the apostles who uh, we had lost a lot of those things. Well, they've actually gotten restored back to the church, the body of Christ. And uh, my feeling is that God's intentions in doing this was to get us up to speed, so to speak, with what he is about to do. And he felt that, now this is my opinion, he felt that we were so much, uh, so immature, and babies, so to speak, that uh, how could we ever handle heavenly things if we were super hypersensitive to the point of being offended at the heavenly things you know so he was helping us to regain or recoup what we had lost over the 1900 years essentially 1900 baptism of the holy spirit somewhere in the early 1900s assurance of salvation so that we could have confidence in the love of god each of these i could we could spend some time unpacking them but the 1950s, the evangelists began to get restored back to the body of Christ. Healing evangelists, faith healers, even prophets, the prophetic. But mostly it was through those who had a big mantle. So we called them faith healers. They were special people. 1960s, the pastoral. You saw the shepherding movement and the Jesus people. That was more grassroots. We got back to where people really live. And even though all of these uh, movements or emphasis, when man gets a hold of them, they go out to seed. They go out to, you know, some spurious dissipation, you might say. But the, the fact remains that in the core essence of it, it was a God-designed emphasis. The end of the 60s began to see the emergence of the charismatic renewal. There was a fresh, not just baptism of the Holy Spirit, but a fresh, alive awareness of the presence of God with us. 1970s, we saw the teacher, maybe the office of the teacher, restored to the body of Christ. We got the uh, full brunt of the Word of Faith movement. Just believe the word. Quote, say, pray, and believe the word. 1980s, we saw the prophets or the prophetic restored. And this time now, it wasn't just the prophet, but it was 1 Corinthians 14, we can all prophesy. That was an amazing experience that uh, we realized that God wasn't just reserving his grace for a select few. But it was available for all. The 1990s, we saw the apostolic and the emergence of the apostolic networks. Uh, we also had some other things, such as the various uh, revival centers broke out in Toronto, in Brownsville, 
Cedar Rapids, Iowa, Melbourne, Florida, uh, Smithton. And uh, so we saw those things break out. It was, it's like, whoa, wait a minute. These are, these are major outbreaks in just one decade. It wasn't like one outbreak a century. Now we had like three or four or more in a decade. So the apostolic, now take a look at 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s. Do you see what we, what I think, at least with one perspective, what's it highlight in each of those decades? Evangelist, pastor, teacher, prophetic, apostolic. Does that sound like five-fold ministry? And look at the last two. Well, who were the last two? The prophet and apostle. And there's a verse, I'm sorry I don't have the address for it right now, but it says the apostles and prophet will be displayed last. Whoa, that's kind of interesting. When it gets restored back to the body of Christ, they were the last. So we have a whole lot more we could talk about those. The 2000s, and this one comes from uh, Bill Hammond from Christian Internet. Uh, yeah, Christian International, CI. He said the 2000 be the decade of the saints. And I think that's the discovery of our personal identity in Christ. There was a lot of that in the 2000s. Uh, the father heart of God, finding our sonship in, uh, in God. And, and uh, there was also the emergence of the grace message again, which has always been appropriate always been valid but it seems like it comes around cycles around and martin luther got it just shall live by faith which of course involved grace but here we got it in i think in the 2000s and it was vital that you and i get the message of grace because where we're going even right now the places that we're going in the heavenlies require that we be free from condemnation, free from the preoccupation with our sin consciousness. It requires that the CPU, that the memory, my hard drive, it requires that it be freed up from being consumed with sin consciousness. That's, I believe, the very essence and the power of grace. It helps to free us up. Because the truth is, if when we begin to move into things that are beyond the mind, our mind wants to kick in and defile us. It wants to hold us back and say, ah, 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 you can't go there because you did this, you thought that, you said this, you whatever. And it wants to hold us back into a world paradigm, a fallen paradigm. 2000 teens, and this is again from uh, Bill Hammond, says he felt like he'd see the army of God come forth. And in this case now, we're not wrestling with flesh and blood, but we're simply coming into being able to have the faith of God. Jesus said at one point, have the faith of God. Most of the translators called it faith in God. But if you wanted to do it correctly, there are other translators say, no, nope, it's more correctly translated to have the faith of God. And that's just like little children. That's not heavy duty grunting. That's not fasting and praying till you get the faith in God or somehow it's no, it's like little children just believing. In 2020s, I get this from Bob Jones, entering into the rest of God, learning how to cease from striving. Because where we're going, striving won't help you. In fact, it'll probably be a ball and chain on our capacity to flow into it, into what God's design is. Now, the reason I highlighted this is because where we're going is we want, and I believe God wants, he wanted it first, and we we're just picking up on it. He wants union with us. He wants us to have union with him. 
so that there's no difference between. And that's what we started off with in the first part of our Zoom today. This unity, this union, union this oneness between us and God. And so if we're going to go there, I feel like God in his wonderfully strategic wisdom begin adding various components to our understanding. They're now installed in our history. They were always in the Word of God, but they're now installed in our history. And hopefully, we'll learn from each of those. And we won't get offended over where man took it out into error, but rather we'll see the essence of what God was presenting in each one of those emphasis. Interestingly, I, it's in, again, in God's great wisdom, every new emphasis is built on the emphasis of the previous one. And so for, it would be uh, disadvantageous to us to poo-poo whatever he did yesterday, because each one of them are a significant component of our wholeness as we move into union with God. <laughs> We're going to have a good time. Some of the prerequisites for moving into the supernatural. I was taking this from a book that maybe some of you have looked into. Translation by Faith by Bruce Allen and Michael Van Vleiman. He just does a wonderful job of just taking people from square one. It's a workbook, a study book. He does a great job of taking people from square one, saying that you must have some basics in place. You must be saved. You must have the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You must pray or speak in tongues. You must have a bona fide passion for Jesus. You must pursue a Christ-like character. You must try to avoid deception. In other words, your eating places, the places that you feed from, because source matters. Where you eat brings with it the DNA of whoever the source was. So these are, again, some of the basics, the prerequisites for coming into union with God. Let me step into now a reminder of my original, one of our first things we talked about, and that was my little roadmap. It's my personal roadmap. You know, I'm working out my salvation with a fear and trembling. It's not that I found a new way to get to God. There's only one way for that. But I'm finding out how to walk that out. And this is my little roadmap. As we saw, and I'm sure people kind of smiled, we start at the bottom of this document. It's earthbound. We realize there's something called ascension. There's something bigger than just being a mere human. I'm probably going to need some assistance, though. Angelic, even saints. And last week, and probably most of us have been experimenting and, and exploring the area of spirit travel, traveling with Holy Spirit. Key word, emphasis on Holy Spirit. There are other, there are other ways to move in the spirit realm. Jesus calls anybody who does that a thief and a robber. John 10, 1. He calls them a thief and a robber. The implication is you can do it other ways, but you're a thief and a robber. And if you read uh, one of the books that have been on a reading list called Traveling in the Spirit Made Simple, he explains that if you do it another way, there is very very legitimate cause or reason to be fearful because you do not have Holy Spirit's accompaniment. And you're out there on something very fragile, which many 
non-Christian spirit travel people refer to as the silver cord. And if you lose the silver cord, then you're, uh, you may never find your place or way back to your body. That's not what we do. There's two things that look similar. There's this spirit travel that the non-Christians use, and there's a spirit travel that Christians use. They look similar, but they have a very, very different operating system. Their source is starkly different, couldn't be more different. They're light and dark. Jesus came to give life and life more abundantly. The devil came to rob, kill, and destroy. The motivating force of the two sources are diametrically opposed. We only want to embrace one of those sources, and that is Holy Spirit travel. Now, we're moving up on my roadmap, and I think that we're somewhere up to the fourth or fifth level of this. I'm not dogmatic about this. You do not have to adopt this way. You're powerful to have your own opinion, and it can be different from mine. No problem. This is just my way of working out my salvation. Some have said, you can't move in any of this without union with God. And I totally get it. I totally get it. Apart from some com communion, some union with God, you cannot and you certainly should not move in any of these. But here's my way of looking at it. God, in his wonderful kindness, knows that we as humans need some goodness of God, which helps lead us to repentance or a change of mind. If we don't have that goodness, we may not be able to just latch on to, oh, I want to be one with God. And I want to quote a verse here. <clears throat> oh, I'm sorry. Oh, yes. Romans 2.4. Romans 2.4. It's the goodness of God that leads us to repentance or to having a change of mind. And so in my world, just my paradigm, it's not the complete picture. It's not the whole paradigm. It's just the way that I've been able to kind of handle it. I've seen some of these lower steps as being God saying, uh, Mark, I'd like to captivate your heart. I'd like to give you, as it were, a lollipop. <laughs> I'd like to capture your attention. And I want to win you with my goodness until you realize that I am really the source behind all lollipops and that you'll have an, a heightened, awakened desire to be one with me, to have union with me. Now, I'm just a, I'm a frail clay pot that doesn't respond nobly a good portion of the time but God transcends my clayness and he wins me with his goodness until my heart is awakened. And then I can say, oh, God, all I really want is you. I realize that you're awakening in me, not just desires of what is because of what's happened in yesterday the lollipops that you shared with me. But now my mind is being bathed with visions of where you want to take me. You are giving me your dreams. Your dreams are being awakened in me. And I realize that I want you now more than all the other lesser loves that's being awakened and so that's why my little roadmap makes sense to me if you have another roadmap that works better for you work that one
But I feel like that God has been entreating us by giving us heavenly experiences. And he says, these are big. These are bigger than your little humanness. Do you want to stay back there in yesterday? Of course you don't. So I'm giving you entreating packages, gifts that will speak to you where you are to help usher you into a desire to be more closely unified with me. And so that brings us up to about mid-page on my roadmap, and that is union with God. I have a more of a strong sense of desire to be one with God than ever in my life, and I've walked with God all of my life, essentially. I've had high times. They've been wonderful. I've had low times. I've had times where I had two years where I didn't hear the voice of God. That was tough, really tough. I knew I was saved, but I didn't feel saved. I knew that his word said I was safe in love, but I had no rhema to tell me that. Man can't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds. And I didn't have that word that proceeds out of the mouth of God, and I didn't feel very alive. But his word was true nonetheless, and he carried me through those times. Let's talk just a little bit about sin. Let me go back over to the document for today. Just a word about sin. The problem with sin isn't on God's end. He's already gotten over us. He already sent his son to take care of your sin and my sin. All sins we've ever committed, are committing, or will commit. They've already been forgiven. It's up to us to receive it. It's up to us to acknowledge, oh, Jesus, you've already covered me. And so I just receive that forgiveness now. Thank you. I acknowledge it. Uh, 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's the only verse in the Bible that I know of that says we must confess it. I don't believe that's a confession that gets him to forgive us because he's already forgiven. There's only one sacrifice ever in all of eternity, all of time, that was worthy or capable of forgiving us. And that sacrifice is done. There remaineth no more sacrifice capable of forgiving sins. And so the confession part is, oh, Jesus, that didn't look good on me. You have gotten something much better for me than what I just committed or did or whatever. It's my desire to walk more nobly Thank you for forgiveness of sin that has always been mine, full and free. So the problem with sin isn't on God's end. He's already taken care of that. It's the damage that sin does to our souls. It makes us callous. It make us, makes us thick or insensitive. It puts a skin or a hardness over our souls so that we can't respond or feel or be sensitive. And so we've got to embrace the grace of God. Titus 2, verse 11 and 12. For the grace of God has appeared that our offers salvation to all people. And what's the grace do? It teaches us to say no. To say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. Is it the law that teaches us to say no? No. No. The law incites us to sin. It's grace, the grace of God, that teaches us to say no. So when the grace teaching came through about 15 to 20 years ago, God in its height about 10 years ago and people began having grace wars, I'm like, oh 
my goodness. Better be careful here. It's a stark, di uh, stark polar, uh, polar difference between the law and grace. We tend to opt towards law to think that's how we live pure and upright. Paul says exactly the opposite happens. So anyway, just move on beyond that, that sin is not a problem on God's end. It's only a problem on our end. So the Lord's helping us to come up above that and live a, uh, oh, a no, more noble life. I want to read now from Colossians 3, verses 1 through 3 from the Mirror Bible Translation. And let me see if I've got this. So a few years ago, I spent a couple of years, two or three years, studying the Mirror Bible Translation. And there are some reasons why I don't continue to study it, but there are some very powerful parts of it that are very appropriate. And so I'd like to read for you just the first three verses of Colossians 3, verses 1 through 3. This is speaking to us in our today's context is union with Christ, union with God. And so this, the language of uh, the author here of the Mirror Bible is just, he just puts out an amazing picture, word picture for us. He says, you are in fact raised together with Christ. Now ponder with persuasion. In other words, get serious. Put, put umph behind your pondering. Ponder with persuasion the consequence of your co-inclusion in him. What is the consequence? The consequence is the radical change that has taken place. The radical change of position that has taken place when you were co-included in him. You were co-buried, co-crucified, co-raised, co-seated, co-heirs. Now be dogmatic, be persistent, think with persuasion of how powerful this radical relocation is for you. Relocate yourselves now mentally. Engage your thoughts with throne room realities where you are co-seated with Christ, listen to this, in executive authority of God's right hand. Jesus is seated at Father's right hand, and you are you and I are seated with Christ at the Father's right hand. That's the position of favor. That's where you and I are. We must bathe our minds until that becomes our default thinking. Let me read that uh, sentence one more time. Engage your thought with throne rooms realities where you are co-seated with Christ in executive authority of God's right hand. Verse 2, become affectionately acquainted with these thoughts. And when you do, it will keep you from being distracted again by earthly realms. Become affectionately acquainted. In other words, fall in love. Fall in love. Let your heart fall in love with these throne room realities. A renewed mind will help conquer the space that was previously occupied by worthless pursuits and habits. Verse 3. Your union with his death, remember you were co-crucified and co-buried, broke the association with that old world. See yourselves now located in a fortress where your life is hidden with Christ in God. Occupy your mind with this new order of life, for you've died. You died when Jesus died. Whatever defined you before, defines you no more. Christ, in whom the fullness of deity dwells, he's the one who defines you now. Here's it sums up now. The secret of your life is your union with Christ in God. 
Well, there's more in that passage. And like I said, the author of the Mirror Bible just does a, an amazing job at painting some great pictures. And our context and theme today is a te, uh, reaching for union with God. And so God surrounds us with his word. He surrounds us with his, as I mentioned earlier, lollipops of his goodness until our heart is one with desire. We're gripped with new passion to be completely one with him. Now, let me read you a few verses. Listen to God's heart for me, from you and me. His dream for you and me is that Christ be formed in you. Listen to God as he entreats us to himself to actually walk, talk, and breathe life like him. Jesus said in Luke 12, Do not fear, my little flock, for it's a father's good pleasure to give you now all of his kingdom, including himself. Galatians 4, My dear children, for whom I am again in pains of childbirth, until Christ is formed in you. See, God's, he's reaching for, this was Holy Spirit preaching and praying through uh, Paul. He's laboring, he's longing through Paul. I want Christ to be formed in you. So there's no difference between you and Christ. Ephesians 4, until we grow up in all things, even unto the head. To me, I get pictures of the body is growing up in all things until eventually there's no difference between the head and the body. That's again John 17, that great homogenizing that takes place. Father and Jesus and us all becoming one together. Romans 8, for those God foreknew, he also predestined us to be conformed into the image of of his son. Oh, guys and gals, this is just stupendous. It's bigger than our little brain can comprehend, but he's massaging us. He's massaging our minds and massaging our souls to be able to see it, to be able to embrace it, to ingest it, to wear it until when we begin to breathe it and speak it, it just comes out by default. Ephesians 4 again. Becoming mature, we attain to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Ephesians 3. To know this love, to let this love bathe us and bathe us and keep washing us until it goes beyond anything my mind can comprehend until... I get filled up to the measure of all the fullness of God. Oh, my friends, think of this. The same God who spoke the universe into being. His words hold everything together. They consist by the word of his power. And they, they uh, are in their being. They're in their state for his pleasure. And Ephesians says, it's God's desire that you and I would be filled up with all that fullness. The fullness of whoever that God was that spoke those things into being. God says, I want you to be filled up with that fullness. John 17, I have given them my glory that you gave me so that they may be one as we are one. I and them and you and me that they may be perfectly unified. 1 John 4, 17. John, the, Re John the uh, beloved revelator, is writing under inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So these are true words. He says, now I want you to know something. You are as he is in this world. You and I are being awakened to an amazing reality that God has come to reside in us. And he's imputed, imparted, infiltrated, spoken his very DNA, his very identity into us. And here's a powerful phrase. Jesus 
now has a body, it's you. It's you and it's me. This God of the universe, Jesus, the Prince of Peace, the wonderful Son of God, who longed for and loved to have a bride way before there was dirt. He said, oh, I love this bride and I've got a plan to win her to myself and then pour all of myself into her. And he says that I'm going to marry her and she's going to become my body. There's going to be the exchange of DNA, mine into her until her and I, there's no difference. We become as he is in the world. What do you think it would look like if you and I were consumed with zeal for our father's house? What would it look like if you and I were fully aware of our oneness, our union with God? What would your heart look like? What would your mind look like? What would your deeds look like? What would your words look like? And I don't in any way, don't even go down the, the route of condemnation or I woulda, shoulda, coulda. Don't go down that. Dream the dreams of God. Dream the dreams of our Father who says, I just, the only thing I want is that you won't have too small of thinking. That your heart will be completely captivated by my dreams for you. That's the only thing I'm dreaming for, longing for. Oh, don't let the smallness of thinking, don't let smallness of thinking keep you from what I've got for you. Father's design for us is that we would be one with him more the more we're conformed and more consumed and the more he's fashioned and formed in us and the more liberty and author the more liberty and authority he gives us and the more he gets to give us the kingdom and the more we can receive his magnanimous gift of co everything with him that we were co everything with god from co crucified to co buried to co raised co co resurrected and in co-seated and co-heirs and now co-reigners. And God says, I want there to be such a believing system, such a unity with me, such a union with me, so that there would be no restrictive forces, no throttling, no restraining of your believing system, that whatever my magnanimous thoughts are for you, would be wholeheartedly embraced and manifested in your lives. There's a verse that says, uh, uh, I'm sorry, I can't quote the first part of it, it says, according to the power that works when, within us. Now we have an amazing God within us and the power restraining is not on his end. If there's any restraining, it's on our end, our ability or inability to believe. And so I feel like this is the Lord's desire in our, his heart. He says, I got some new higher places I want to take you. In my roadmap now, we're going to go to things like our youth being renewed. We're going to go to transfiguration. We're going to go into full governance with God. And that's going to require our hearts being even more and more conformed into his image, not by grunting, not by straining or squealing, but by just believing, responding to the awakened desire in his heart to become unified with us in all dimensions. He's a better father than we have ever imagined. His love is more transformative than any love we've ever experienced. He's changing us back. Think of Adam who fell. Jesus and the love of our Father is changing us back into his very image so that there's no difference between Jesus and me and Jesus and you. Say with me, 
I'm in him and he's in me. Let's say that together. I'm in him and he's in me. Thank you, Lord, for entreating us, sprinkling our hearts with this heaven dust, so to speak, that begins awakening desire. You begin depositing dreams, your dreams, into us of where you want to take us, how powerful and how radical that is. We're grateful, Father, that you are so kind and so understanding. Your wisdom in, in your ability to get down inside of us and awaken us with desire. We love that about you, your most wonderful Father. Amen.